Champaign County Master Gardener Monthly Program. I'm Tabitha Elder, Champaign County Master Gardener Program Coordinator. It's my pleasure to introduce our guest presenters, Susan Smith and Gail Brody, Champaign County Master Gardeners. Miss Brody is an experienced gardener who's been cultivating her own rose garden since 1992. She serves on the Master Gardener Advisory Committee, volunteers in the rose section at the Idea Garden, and is the volunteer in charge of Champaign County's horticulture hotline. Gail will describe types of roses ranging from shrubs to climbers. Ms. Smith is a consulting rosarian candidate, a member of the Stephen Decatur Rose Society, the Ileana District Rose Society, the American Rose Society, and is an outstanding master gardener as recognized by the University of Illinois Extension. Susan will review rose planting and care, including problems and their solutions. And without further delay, here is Susan Smith. Thank you, Tabitha, and welcome to this rose presentation. In uh, 2013, I was asked if I wanted to work in the rose section at the Idea Garden. And I thought, here's my chance to learn how the roses I planted in my sister's memory. Diane, the leader at that time, asked me if I had any, ro any roses, and I said, yes. And she said, what are they? And I said, um, yellow climbers? I felt pretty dumb, so I came home, and I pulled out the folder where I keep all my plant labels, and I studied my rose labels. So I could now tell her I had two lemon meringues, a sport of Westerland, hybridized by William Radler in 2005, and William Radler of Knockout Rose fame. I came to roses to learn, I fell in love with them, and now I wanna share the joy I found with you. There's that lemon meringue. Um, last year, it reverted to the sport, and see how one side is orange and one side is yellow, there's the orange, that's the original rose. And then eventually it reverted to the William, uh, no, the Dr. Huey that it was uh, grafted to. And so this year I'm replacing that rose. So choosing a rose, this list is your guide to selecting the right rose for your garden. This list contains criteria that makes growing roses easier and there's some things in there that are definitely personal preferences. Gail will present types of roses for you to become familiar with. You ready, Gail? I am. Next. Okay, I'm gonna to talk to you today about different types of roses. Uh, the first group are old garden roses, which include china rose, tea rose, moss rose, damas rose, and bourbons. What are old garden roses? Any rose of a class which was in existence before the year 1867 is considered an old garden rose. Why 1867? That was the year a rose named La France was introduced. La France is considered to be the first hybrid tea and the first modern rose. What are the classes of roses that make up the old garden roses? Well, there are a lot, but generally they fall into two subclasses, antique and old roses. Old roses are the ones found in Europe before the late 1700s. And antique roses are those who can trace part of their ancestry back to the china rose, which was first, the first re true repeat blooming rose known to the Western world. The china rose has, <clears throat> was introduced to Europe around 1792. While this may sound confusing, there is another way to separate antique and old roses. Old roses usually do not repeat bloom and antique roses usually do. Why? Because of the influence of the China rose into the breeding program. This repeat blooming ability changed roses forever. Next. 
modern roses. And this includes hybrid teas, grandifloras, floribundas, shrubs, climbers or ramblers, and miniatures. La France is believed to be the first hybrid tea rose and began the modern rose history. La France was initially classified as a hybrid perpetual, but they soon realized it was a new type of rose and the hybrid tea was created. The classification of modern roses can be quite confusing because many modern roses have old garden roses in their ancestry and their forms vary so much. Most garden, modern roses are classified by their growth and their flowering characteristics. Next. Hybrid teas are, were initially created by crossbreeding a hybrid perpetual and a tea rose. They are the first group of modern roses. Hybrid tea roses have well-formed, large, high-centered buds supported by long, straight stems, which make them great cut flowers. Most hybrid tea bushes tend to be somewhat upright in habit and reach between four and five feet tall, depending on the cultivar, the growing conditions, and the pr pruning regime. Hybrid teas are the most popular rose type worldwide. Next. Grandiflora roses are a cross between a hybrid tea rose and a floribunda rose. They are a combination of the graceful blooms of a hybrid tea and the repeat blooming of the floribunda. They are tall, hardy roses and are often disease resistant. Unlike the hybrid tea rose with their single flower at the end of a long stem, grandifloras have multiple buds and often bloom in clusters. Queen Elizabeth was the first grandiflora rose and introduced in 1954. It is a very tall rose, often re reaching six to seven feet with clear pink blooms. Next. Floribundas. Floribundas are a cross between a polyanthus and a tea rose. The first polyantha hybrid tea cross, Red Riding Hood, was introduced in 1907. While they are smaller and bushier than the average hybrid tea, they are less dense and sprawling than the average polyantha. Other breeders also began introducing similar varieties and in 1930, the name Floribunda was coined by Dr. J.N. Nicholas, a rose hybridizer for Jackson and Perkins, Perkins in the US. The term has been used since then to describe the cultivar. Floribundas are usually shorter, three to four feet tall, have short stems with an abundance of flowers or clusters and are great rebloomers. Next. Climbers and ramblers. While people often use the term climber and rambler interchangeably, they are two different classes of roses. Both varieties develop long canes well adapted to training on arbors, gazebos, fences, and pillars. Climbing roses are a variation or a mutation of a bush type variety. Ramblers tend to have long flexible canes, sometimes 20 to 30 feet long, and usually bloom only once. Ramblers tend to grow faster than climbers and they like to sprawl. Rambler stems are more pliable than climbers and easier to weave through open fences and trellises. Neither climbers or ramblers are like vines and they need to be physically attached to their supportive structures. They also need to be pruned and trained in a specific way to maximize flower production. And Susie will discuss this in greater detail later in the program.
Next. Shrubs. This class of roses is really like a catch-all for roses that don't fit well into other classes. They are a diverse group of roses, usually a larger size than most modern roses, have thornier stems, and often scented flowers. They may repeat bloom or bloom only once in the summer. Many shrub roses are suitable for hedging or make great specimen plants. One of the more popular members of the group are knockout roses. Knockouts are known for their low maintenance and disease resistance, making them a popular addition to the home garden. Next. Miniatures. Miniature roses are real roses, bred to be small. They are a dwarf in the true sense of the word. A mini should be a perfectly scaled down version of a large flower rose. The flowers, buds, leaves, stems, and even the thorns must be in perfect proportion to each other. Within the category are those that resemble hybrid teas, floribundas, climbers, creeping ground roses, and even old garden roses. Minis tend to be more winter hardy since they grow on their own roots and are great rebloomers. Next. Rose heights. I can't stress enough how important it is for anyone choosing a rose to read the label and to find out exactly the mature height and width is going to be. As you can see here, we start with the minis, go to the floribundas, hybrid teas, grandiflores, trees, and climbers. And you don't want, say, like a grandiflora down in the front of the flower bed. Roses can be pruned and trained, but only to a point. And roses do want to grow to their mature height and width in order to bloom. So if you plant a glandiflora down in the front of the bed, you're never going to be able to make it a short rose. So pick wisely. Next. What rose is the correct one for me? Well, with all the choices out there, it can be really confusing. I think the first thing you need to look for is what color do you want? If you really want a pink rose, then you start there. Do you want it to be fragrant? Personally, I think this is one of the most important features of a rose. Height, again, like I talked about earlier, is it going in the back of the flower bed? Do you want it down in the very front of the flower bed? Disease resistance, becoming more and more popular amongst rose buyers and rose growers. And Luckily for all of us, the breeders are taking this seriously and are coming up with many more disease resistant <coughs> varieties. And do you want them for a cut flower? If you do, you're not going to plant a floribunda or a mini. So once you answer all of these questions, then narrowing down your choices is a lot easier. So the next time you're thinking about buying a new rose, or even starting your first one. Check this list and then go shopping. Next. Thank you, Gail. That's really good advice and I hope you fell in love one of the, with one of the roses she shared with us. Um, when um, asked to do this by the program committee, one of the questions they submitted was, is there a tougher rose that to take the place of the knockouts that they lost in 2018. Earth kind roses were chosen for their tolerance to pests, heat, and drought, and cold. Texas A&M is also working on rose rosette disease resistant with their roses. In this uh, slide, I'm showing four of the roses we currently have at the Idea Garden. Uh, there are 22 currently on the list. The Decatur, Stephen Decatur Rose Society is trialing new roses in hopes of adding to that list. 
So there's the 22. And again, the ones I've highlighted with the yellow halo around them are the ones we have currently at the Idea Garden. And I think there's a pretty good selection there. So if you want a real easy care rose, that's where you start. A lot of those, um, Gail talked about antique roses. New Dawn is considered an antique rose and that's on the bottom on the right. Um, and the Belinda's Dream up in the top left is the rose that they judge all other roses against. And that is a very good performing shrub rose. Site selection is uh, a, a huge criteria for growing roses. They need full sunlight six to eight hours. There are some shade tolerant roses. Uh, that was one of the questions submitted. Um, I went to two different rose uh, catalogs online and they each offered 70 plus shade tolerant roses. Some of the old garden roses are more shade tolerant than the new modern roses, but they all need good circulation that will help you with your uh, leaf issues. Well-drained soil, high in organic matter. Here in our area, zone five, we tend to have some clay by the time you dig down to where you need to plant the rose. So if you add that organic matter, you're way ahead. Uh, proper pH of six to six five. Although roses will tolerate a wide range, they will survive five to seven eight. I said survive, you may not see a bloom. Uh, some amendments that are especially uh, in the limelight right now are mycorrhizae, which is a good fungi, living fungi that you add to the garden and it starts the plants off on a good healthy start. Another good one is mushroom compost, worm castings compost, and just compost in general, mixed compost. If you start the bed early, um, I'm going to talk about how to plant a rose next, but if you started a new bed and you worked all those amendments in them, you are going to save yourself digging that two by two by two hole. So if you're planting a rose, most of us have heard the old time gardeners use the adage, never put a $10 plant $2 hole. The money might have been a different. A good hole is important for root development root development is the function of a healthy plant. A hole at least twice the size of the root ball, again, if you haven't amended that bed ahead of time. It, it encourages uh, the roots to establish and get the plant off to a good start. So if you bought a bare root plant, you must open the package because mostly they come by uh, mail order and soak that rose. And you can put a growth hormone in there if you want to. I don't. I just soak it in plain old water. And then uh, at least several hours before you plant it, then you're going to dig that beautiful hole. And in the bottom of the hole, you're going to mound 12 inches or so of soil. Uh, that, will, that way you can spread those little roots around that. You can throw in a hand if you have it on hand and that's for root development. We'll talk a little more about that when we get to uh, fertilizers. In our zone, I highlighted in red, we cover the crown, that place right there where everything comes together, at least two inches. Two reasons. Uh, Illinois, Windy City. <laughs> We don't want this rocking while it's trying to establish roots because if it rocks in the wind, you'll pull those roots there, the little feeder roots out. Uh, we also want to protect it from that winter freeze. And I know a lot of you lost roses. And if you planted it at the same soil level, if it was a container rose, that may have been your problem that that. Uh, what do I want to call it? Ah! <laughs> that root wasn't deep enough. If you got a container rose, it's kind of like any other perennial that you got to add to the garden. Dig that nice hole, again, um, the rose out of the container, wiggle any root bound roots, you probably won't find too many, but if you do, wiggle those free, uh, fill the hole with soil, water it thoroughly on both types of roses, and uh, water it well again and cover it with mulch. But when we mulch, we do not want that mulch up against the canes. So now you've planted the rose, you want it, you want it to grow. So how do you get to do it? 
Well, you've selected the rose and you planted it. Now it's time to take care of it. The first year, do not fertilize it. It's too harsh for those new little feeder roots down there. Water is your best fertilizer that first season while you're establishing a rose. Uh, water early in the day, do not do as this picture shows, watering it overhead. You want to water the soil at the base of the plant to avoid uh, leaf diseases. If you do, if we have rain, hopefully it's early in the day and it gets a chance to dry off before evening. The second year and beyond, you can begin your regular fertilizing plants and roses are hungry, but we don't start feeding them until after the last frost and we end by mid-August. That's very important to put the rose in a dormant state later on. Um, roses will need fertilizer every three weeks while blooming. Liquid fertilizers are more readily available and therefore the rose takes it up faster and you get more benefits and liquid fertilizers do not burn the roots. So a little bit more about fertilizer. Where does it go? You know you've seen bags with the 10, 10, 10 right on them. And N is the first number, nitrogen. Phosphorus is the second number. And um, potash is the third number. Nitrogen is for above ground. You'll have um, healthy vegetative growth. Uh, too little and you'll have yellow leaves and small blooms. Too much, you'll have lush, lush plants with no blooms. Phosphorus for below the ground. As I said, when you're planting it, you can throw a handful of super phosphorus in because it takes a long time to get that phosphorus through that six inches or 20 inches of soil that you have just put on top of that root. So if you've got super phosphorus, add it when you're planting. That helps with abundant flower production. That's what you want, right? Um, too little and you'll have dull foliage, falling leaves, weak flower stems, and buds that may not open. So it is best to add that handful at planting. Potassium is used for the whole plant like a, a multivitamin. Uh, it's also known as potash. It encourages growth. It's like an immune system booster and it helps the plant through stress times, which are disease, insect damage, drought, cold temperatures, and a lack of potassium will produce weak stems, poorly developed buds, yellow edges on the leaves, which then will turn brown. Uh, it's best to find a fertilizer that has some of those secondary nutrients, magnesium, calcium, sulfur, as well as micronutrients, and sometimes those bags will come labeled biotone or biozone or maybe total advantage. Or you'll just look at the back of the bag and where the ingredient list is, you'll see them listed in what percentage that the bag contains. They build a healthy soil that will make the rose healthy. Watch it on time-released fertilizers. I know Osmocote is a very popular uh, slow release fertilizer. You can get it in formulas that go four months or you can get it in formulas that go up to 12 months. And remember, we don't wanna feed the roses after August 15th. If you do, that new growth will be frosted off and you'll have to come back and prune it. And every time you prune, you encourage new growth. Soil pH, I, I said how uh, important that is. Between six and six five, you can see this green bar going down here. That's the optimum pH, and that is where it will take up those um, secondary and micronutrients that it needs to grow. So you can see uh, that the proper pH will allow the rose to absorb the nutrients it needs. You can see as you go below you'll get too much or sometimes too little. So if we, one thing you do is work on pH, you'll have uh, better success with roses. And around here, our normal pH is seven or sometimes even above. So you probably have to add some um, sulfur to lower that. California is the only place I think I can think of off the top of my head that has uh, real low and they have to add limestone to raise it. 
So when we're working in the rose garden, we need some tools. We need gauntlet gloves to protect ourselves. Uh, we need lopers and pruners to get the clipping done and shape the roses what we want. When we make the cuts, we use a waterproof wood glue. And when we go from rose to rose, we sanitize our pruners between each rose so that we don't spread disease. Our favorite is good old alcohol, and we put it in a spray bottle. It evaporates very quickly on your tools, and it doesn't corrode. Uh, Clorox products, or chlorine products, sorry, uh, tends to pit it, and those things are too expensive to throw away at the end of the season. So we chose the alcohol. We use a soft uh, tie if we're training a rose or if we want it to grow in a particular way, even if it's a shrub. We use, these are 12 inch tweezers that we pick up the leaves and the little uh, cuts we've made that fall down in the middle of the rows and we can't get our hands in there. We pick those up. We use a little leaf rake for underneath because I'm gonna talk about cleaning up everything. And we use a wheelbarrow is especially handy for digging that soil out, putting it in the wheelbarrow, mixing the amendments back into it and then putting it on the rows and any extra you might have, you just spread over the rest of the garden. Pruning, I know this is one of the things that um, when I have new people come to the rose garden, they're most hesitant about this. And Ben Hanna of Heirloom Roses um, published this PRUNE acronym, P-R-U-N-E, easy to remember, right? So first you have to prepare the plant, remove the cane so you can get in there and work without stabbing yourself or poking yourself. Um, R, it, this, is the real, this is the most important statement. If you remove the dead wood, the spindly canes, the diseased canes, you're pretty much done. And you can start with the dead, it's not gonna come back, so there's no fear in taking that off and saying, oops, I made a mistake. Uh, the spindly canes, we call those anything smaller than a pencil width. Disease canes, you're going to notice it. They'll have spots or scars or uh, cankers or on them, and so you just take them out. So understand your plant. Like Gail was talking about the heights of plants, this is where you are not going to prune that climber to be at the front of the garden. Or do you have a hybrid tea and you want really long stems? If you're growing hybrid teas and you're showing roses, you have to have a perfectly straight long stem. But if you're just uh, displaying roses in your garden, then you want more blooms. And so you just um, cut it a, a little differently and we'll get into that. Nothing left behind. Sanitation is one of the biggest things you can do to prevent leaf diseases. So nothing left behind. So when you working in the rows, all those little tiny leaves, you pick them up and you dispose of them. You do not compost them because all of those leaf diseases over winter. And we want to prevent that disease from starting the next year off. So you really want to enjoy your rows. So stand back and admire your rows and don't be surprised if you go back in and make another cut that you were afraid to make in the first place. So phenology is pruning or doing any garden chores, not by the calendar, by, but what mother nature tells us is going on. So that first picture is not a rose, that is a forsythia. And the forsythia is a good indicator of when it's time to get out and start pruning your roses. So I was asked specifically about knockout roses. Um, you can prune them all the way back 12 to 18 inches. You prune them, take out the dead first, the spindly first, the crossing, the ones that will rub each other or rub up against your foundation or your fence or whatever you have them near. Uh, the third picture I want to show you, uh, we had that 2018 was hard on us in the rose garden as well. And so that is not 12, 18 inches tall but you cut the cane until you get to a nice flesh, creamy center. That is nice, live, healthy insides. If it were black, it's not gonna have that. So you just keep cutting down the cane until you get that. And I'm gonna refer to that again. So remember what that looks like. 
And then these little tiny, oh, these are tender new shoots that um, when we are uncovering the roses in the spring from our winter protection, those can break off very easily. So you want to start that very gently. Spring pruning your rose bushes, any other things besides, you know, all the other things that aren't climbers, <laughs> hybrid teas, um, all the rest. Uh, again, follow that prune acronym. You're going to remove um, dead wood, weak growth, those little tiny pencil size things. You're going to remove interior crossing where these two are going to cross. They are going to rub and you're going to get a canker or a open wound that an insect will just love. This says remove about half of last year's growth. That's not as easy to remember as remove one third of its entire height. So if you've got a three foot shrub, you can take it a foot off. We've got a seven foot shrub, we can take you know, a foot and a half off. Then I've included a couple of diagrams on the correct cut. You wanna cut it at a 45 degree angle. You want it near an outward facing bud and that quarter inch protects it. If it's too close like this one, you may break that off the next time you come in to work on the rows. Uh, it's too slanted and too close. Too flat, you may have a dew uh, or raindrop sitting on that and it softens that up if you miss gluing it. The hybrid teas take, they're one of the longest roses to go from prune to bloom. And I'm gonna show you a chart on that in a few minutes, but we have a garden walk and so we have to have things ready for that and i'm going to talk about that too but if you can remember to cut back one third of almost any rose you you're working on other than a climber i say spring training your climbing rose this is my favorite job in the idea garden it takes the longest but it is the most rewarding to me again we start when the forsythia are blooming Look at this thing that's on a fence. Um, and here is a, a, a diagram of the pruning. And first let's talk about the anatomy. On this rose, you have two canes. The main cane, which you can tra trace all the way back down to the ground or the crown. That's the word I couldn't think of before. Okay, and then the secondary shoots are called laterals. That's where you bloom. If you tie this main cane straight up in the air and it's a 15 foot rose, you would have one rose at the top of the 15 feet. If you train it at a 45 degree angle, each one of the laterals thinks it's got to go up to the top and each one of those will put on a rose. And you can have as many, the, the further you have this, uh, 45 or more, the more laterals you will have. Those you can prune to uh, leaf sets at four inches up to 12 inches. And the reason for that is maybe you lost this cane last winter and, and you don't, you have a big space in here. So you can let that lateral grow longer if you wanna fill that space in. It's my favorite job. Um, Rose people say that if you had 15 shrub roses or hybrid teas and one climber, you will spend 95% of your time on the climber if you want it to perform like this one. We have one on each end of the fence. It's just, look at that, it's just fabulous. And that's just in the tying it to the support. So just for review, I have that picture of the climber and I have the picture of, so you can see the difference. You are doing some of the same things. You are still removing the dead. You are still removing uh, crossing and damaged canes. But one, you will select five or more. Depends on how wide your support is. We have one support at the Idea Garden that will only support three canes. So if I lose one of those, it's kind of scary. But most, if you have a, traditional arbor you can keep up to five on that to train so i talked about the bloom to prune time one of my favorite um rosarians is paul zimmerman he is a rosarian an author he has his own rose uh, business and he oversees the american rose trials at the biltmore and um 
he came up with this bloom time chart, which I think is fabulous. We, like I said, we have that idea garden walk and we need to know when to start so that we want a complete show. We want every rose blooming when people come. And you can see that they go from 60 days to 35 days and prune to bloom time. So we like to start with the ones that take 60 days. We got to back up from the middle of June. We start in the middle of April. And hopefully when um, our garden walk is, we have a full show of blooms. I did, I uh, included this in case you have a family reunion or maybe a wedding in your own garden, or maybe you just want them all showing at the same time. Unfortunately, there's a few problems in the rose garden, but there is everywhere, but don't let it upset you. It's not, it's not as bad as you think. Insect damage. Over here we have leaf cutter bee. Leaf cutter bee. She is busy cutting out this perfect circle she is not going to eat that. She is going to line her nest with it. And she is a friend in the garden, so we do nothing about her. Over to the right on the bottom is a rose sawfly slug. That little devil is almost invisible. And he eats one layer of the leaf at a time till he eats all the way through it. And up at the top, if you're far away, you think you had black spot or something, but it is um, so soft lie damage and all we do is pluck them off and squish them and they're always found on the underside of the leaf you don't see them on top so if you see those holes in your leaves lift them up and look underneath for the little culprit and everybody's favorite the one everybody knows is the Japanese beetles <laughs> Uh, we use no pest, no insecticides, excuse me, no insecticides in the rose garden. And so the Japanese beetles, we find it best if we can pick them off twice a day, early in the morning, the closer to sunrise, the better, but our volunteers don't like to work that early. And then again, at sunset, they're kind of in a dormant daze and they're easy to pick off and throw in that bucket of soapy water and they just don't know how to swim. When I talked about that, cane in that early slide of when we were talking about pruning this bottom picture here is a, a cane borer and um, that maybe we missed gluing that cane and it was soft or the rain got on it and it was really soft and usually the cane borer is a beneficial wasp that little parasitic wasp that needs to lay eggs so she comes along and finds a good place to lay the eggs. So if you find a cane like this that looks like a straw hole in the middle, you come over here and you cut it back. Oops, sorry. If you, uh, if you still see this hole in the center, you keep going all the way down the cane and we have had to go all the way to the crown to, to eliminate it and take the whole thing out. But if you would dissect that and cut it in half, you would either see where she laid the eggs and they bored their way out also or that the eggs were still in there and the yellow thing the golden thing is a very very many times magnified thrip and you'll hear about thrips we have not had a real problem with thrips in our idea garden uh, they are hard to see and you will see the damage rather than the little bug you will find um, deformed petals a rose damage that looks very similar to uh, Botrytis blight, which I'm going to show you some pictures of. You may see little tiny spots on the petals. Well, one rosarian wrote an article and um, submitted a natural remedy for them. And we tried it in the idea garden as a demonstration. And you take a blue cup in like a blue solo cup plastic and you spray it with WD-40 and you put it on a stake in the garden near where you suspect the thrip. The thrip is attracted, goes crazy over blue, and the WD-40 wipes them out. Fungal diseases that you'll find in the garden um, happen mostly because of moisture. Black spot is created by rain or a hose from overhead watering, or the splash up 
if we get one of these downpours like we got recently, or if you've got the overhead watering and that soil just splashes up on the leaves. One of the things we're trying in the idea garden is cutting the bottom six uh, inches of leaves off the cane from the ground up and hopefully avoiding some of that splash up. These are things that unfortunately, we do have to use some fungicides. The rose, oh, the poor beautiful bud, she has some um, powdery mildew and that is spread by wind and rain, warm days followed by cool nights. Sounds like our springs here in Illinois, doesn't it? And there's a leaf with some powdery mildew on it. And over to the right is Botrytis blight. Uh, that is very similar. You will notice that the leaves get uh, tan edges. Uh, if it gets really bad, you will have a gray spores, uh, mostly on the underside, like the, like the uh, powdery mildew on this one down here. We usually, uh, sometimes it will be a tight bud and it will be like what we call balling. And you might as well just cut it off. You can try coaxing those petals open, but it just doesn't bloom. And then when it does, it looks like this. So we just cut it off and just wait for a new rose to grow. That, I included some um, uh, labels for you. I forgot, I hope you got your handouts. There were six different handouts out there and I hope they're helpful in answering questions that we don't cover. And someone raised a question about rust, and that is easy to identify because it looks just like rust. It's red-orange spores when the temperatures are 64 to 70 degrees with continued wet for two to four hours. That sounds like another day in Illinois spring. But your best IPM is to get a good healthy uh, soil, get good sanitation and circulation. All of these things are less if you have a good air circulation in there, the leaves can dry off faster. And then you can use fungicide sprays or there are some systemics and there are some organics. So there's lots to choose for out there. Uh, bacterial problems in the garden, we have uh, gall and that is um, like, a, like a tumor. On, the, on a cane and sometimes it is right near a cut. This poor rose was uh, flooded. Someone came into the idea garden and I think they probably wanted to water their dog. They turned on the faucet. He had soaker hoses hooked up to it and they left him on. 48 hours later, this rose was underwater. It was so deep, smelled so bad. We actually took a broom and swept the water into our pathways to get it off the rose and we lost the rose. It was, that's totally bacterial. Uh, it can happen if you don't clean your pruners with that alcohol in between cuts also. You could spread, if you were working on this rose, you would spread it to the next rose. Uh, this rose we had to dig out. Um, we had to destroy it. It was not gonna come back. I think it counted seven galls on that. And uh, if it were a small gall, cause they can be anywhere from like a pea size to these golf ball sizes. Um, we dug this out and then we changed our pathway so that one of the pavers is where this rose was. So we'll remember not to plant a rose there. They are now saying that you may have success. It's going to be worse than digging that two by two hole, replacing with two wheelbarrows of clean soil. So you'd have to dig out a lot of soil, put some new soil in, and then you could perhaps plant a rose right back in that same spot. Um, viral. <laughs> As we know with COVID-19, that there's no cure for viruses. Um, mosaic up here in the top may not be a death sentence. If that is just one leaflet, you cut that back to the cane. If you see other leaflets on one cane, you cut that one cane off and keep it on the rows and perhaps save it. Uh, the, the one that everybody talks about is rose rosette disease. It is a death sentence. It's lethal. Sorry, there's nothing to do about that. If you think you have it, get it confirmed. I have a picture here that looks very similar. This is herbicide damage. If you know you sprayed herbicides or your neighbor sprayed herbicide, it could be that, and then you could cut that off and the rest of the rose would be okay. If it's rose rosette disease, it is spread 
by a might and that might, oh, sorry, I did that again. That might would jump onto the next rose if you just cut this and let it fall. So if you suspect rose rosette disease, the best thing for you to do is take a black plastic garbage bag, put it over the rose, take the drawstrings down at the crown, cut that rose off, containing it in the bag and hopefully all the little mites and destroying it. You cannot burn it, you cannot compost it. I hate to say it, the only way to get rid of it is put it in the trash. But do have it confirmed because those two can have the multi thorns, little lots and lots of thorns, the witch's broom and the burgundy. See, they both have similar things. So do get it confirmed with the plant clinic or ask a rosarian. And you can do that with the American Rose Society. I am on the Rose Rosette Disease Watch Team for the Texas A&M. And so if you suspect it, I can come look at it and confirm it, or you can send me pictures or a sample or something. And if you cut a sample, please put it in a plastic bag if you want to take it into the court hotline when we open up again. But that is the deadliest thing. And they are breeding roses to get away from that, to make them resistant. And then the, everybody's favorite rose problems, rodents. Uh, rabbits could teach us, Gail says, about that 40 de 45 degree angle cut, because if you've ever gone out and looked how they chew things off, it's always a perfect 45 degree cut. And they love to chew the new tender canes, or if it's a tougher cane, they might just eat the outside skin, and again, leaving you that, that cane open to um, boring insects and diseases. Uh, I think wire cages are our best defense. I tried blow up snakes. I tried hanging wind chimes in a tree. I tried buying that rabbit scare uh, spray. I even got hair from my salon. So I said to my daughter, we watched them all go out there and nibble on my new pants. And I said, okay, they like the salad dressing that I put on the greens. They had company with the rubber snake and they had music for dinner. So it didn't do me any good. I have rabbit, I have uh, wire cages around them until they're pretty established. And then voles. Don't let that little cute thing fool you. They are destructive. They took down my 40 year old apple tree in my orchard and they, they are. So I looked it up to see, you know, what do I do about these? I had the best luck with a peanut butter trap. I took six peanut butter, uh, six mouse traps out with loaded with peanut butter. I put them in the runs. I covered it with a branch and so the birds wouldn't pick up. And I turned around to come back in the house and I heard six snaps. I hadn't gone 10 feet and they were caught that many. But just for your information, if you think he's cute and you couldn't hurt him, the females produce up to seven litters a year, averaging from four to six in each litter. And when that new vole reaches 21 days old, they're ready for reproduction. <laughs> so don't feel sorry for them. Companion plants. I know someone asked me about that. This is my new, um, I'm all excited about this. These, these photos that I'm going to show you are from the davidaustinroses.com. And uh, David Austin is also the breeder who dedicated his life to bringing back fragrance in roses. So if you pick a David Austin, you should have some good fragrance. Adding companion plants to the rose bed reduces a lot of the problems, not the rodents, sorry. I haven't found a, I haven't found a cure for that. Um, and I'm personally making a 45 by 10 new rose bed in my yard to uh, test this theory. So in this picture, we have Darcy Bustle, David Austin Rose here. And then this one back here is Thomas Beckett. They don't really look that much different, but the Thomas Beckett really is more red. So I would say this is the uh, photographer. Back here, we are mixing native plants with roses. This is Culver's root, or um, Veronica virginicum. And, 
And here we have some sage, the purple salvia. And they say that if you add those strong um, uh, herbs and things to your garden, uh, plants that will ward off them are garlic, um, scented geranium, sage, thyme, lavender, rosemary, allium, and chives. And they also attract pollinators. And the plant uh, that we should all have in our garden is yarrow. Yarrow attracts ladybugs and they eat aphids, which are a problem in the rose garden. And if you have ever had flocks, you know what aphids are. But some others are oregano, coriander, mint, and dill. And those are edible herbs that you can put in there and they repel those insects. And then you can turn around and just cut them and use them in your kitchen. The second one, I'm a fan of Gertrude Jekyll. That's this pink rose back here. I'm a fan of her, as I don't know if you know her. She took us from Victorian tropical plants in solariums and, and greenhouses in a huge estates in New York to this um, cottage style gardening and borders and things that we enjoy today. In this, she has real uh, blue delphinium, and I suspect this is the East Friesland that's the pinky one. But uh, adding those plants also amplify your fragrance, and I think it's very attractive. Gail once said to me, it's kind of hard to get in there and work on it. Well, you're doing that before they get to this stage. And then, all right, you've enjoyed a full season of roses. You got to put them to bed. So. Um, you can still use the styrofoam cones that they, they still sell those. Um, with the styrofoam cone though, you need to cut the rows down to fit underneath it. Obviously they're not, you know, they're maybe 20 inches, 24 inches tall. So you have to cut the rows down. You have to remove all the leaves and then uh, all the foliage has to come off. Then you should spray them with a um, sulfur fungicide to make sure that there's no, no living uh, fungi still in there. And then up here in the top, you need to punch some holes. They say an apple corer makes a nice hole. You need to have ventilation because we do have some sunny winter days and condensation will build up in that. And then you'll have more rose diseases. So it's a, also you should take it off every once in a while and have a look and, and uh, um, ward off any pests before it's spring. Our preferred method is healing, and I'm sorry I, I didn't uh, get out there when we first healed them. This is a spring picture. You can see how the snow has washed it down into our edging there. But we heal the roses. So we cut off, instead of all the leaves, we only have to cut off the bottom 12 inches, and we spray it with a, a sulfur fungicide or a copper fungicide. Either one will work. And then we cover that rose with 12 inches high hill in the center, making sure that crown is really covered. And then we put mulch on top of it more or less to keep that compost from um, blowing away. And then come spring, you've got compost and started to decompose mulch to enrich your bed when you move on. This is a climbing rose over here. Again, it was spring, even though there's snow on there. And the reason I don't cut canes off until spring is, like I said, this is one of those ones that I'm only going to get to have three canes trained on it. This black is winter kill. That is not going to come back. If you think it is, you start cutting down like I showed you till you find that nice fleshy center. And I'm going to tell you, you're not. Until it's way down here, hopefully underneath that 12 inches, there's some live tissue in there. So you still have to watch for disease. Now what we have had when we do this in our garden, that's when the voles will get in there and nest and Gail can tell you about a rose she pulled out that didn't have any roots on it. And I had seen uh, the, the, uh, the hole that it bore into the hill and then I had filled it in and I had set a um, mouse trap. Another good thing to use a broken pot. If you can set a broken pot on the side and he can get in there, but um, Pets or kids won't get into it and put a mouse trap in there and we caught him. So that's what your rose bed should look like when it's all put together. This is ours put to bed for um, the winter. Um, 
and we'll just sit and watch it and watch the bulls and keep an eye on them. We invited a hawk, but he doesn't stay. Then come wake up the roses time. We'd start looking down here at the base of those um, for some new growth. And look at this Ragosa over here. That is one of the oldest roses. They go back thousands of years. And then you can see over here is a knockout that's got some growth on it. And over here is another one with some green on it. It's kind of a fuzzy picture. I guess I'm not, I'm not the best photographer. <laughs> but um, again, when you uncover those roses, remember those little tiny uh, burgundy shoots that are coming up, they come up right at that crown. So when you're uncovering those, you do it very gently. I like to use my tweezers and pull that back. Uh, some of the girls, uh, some of the team like to use the old pruning fork, uh, no, not pruning fork, sorry, weeding fork, and uh, pull that stuff back, or you can use your fingers. So, but be careful, that tender new shoot might be the only thing you find under there after the winters we've had. But you really want to enjoy your roses all summer long. This is us on garden walk day. And I told you we tried to prune them. So we had a good show. But our garden walk this year was rain all day. So we have a lot of petals on the ground. But it's still a good show of roses. I'm still, you know, we're still happy that we do it. So I hope we answered all of your questions. Um, a few came in kind of late. I included the handouts, uh, roses that grow well in our area. That is zone 5B and 6 and surrounding area. We go, the, this was provided by the Stephen Decatur Rose Society. And uh, we go from, I think, Lincoln to Taylorville and then over to Indiana. So uh, we're kind of a big, big group, a big area. And then I included fragrant roses, and um, those will help you, you know, if you if your fragrance is at the top of your list. And I included a pruning, which gave you some real pictures of real roses. And the labels were so you could get used to looking for those um, uh, nutrients values on the roses, uh, fertilizers. And I think all but one was organic. And the all-in-one is a very good product, uh, the liquid. It's an excellent fertilizer that way. The only thing that holds me back on the all-in-one that's a Bayer product is the insecticide because it's non-selective. It won't just kill Japanese beetles. It will kill all the good bugs and the pollinators that we have. So um, if you found there are more questions or something I said made you think of another question, you can email us at goillinois.edu, Champaign County Master Gardener, ask a master gardener. There's a button on there and Gail is, as they said in the introduction, she is um, in charge of that right now. And so she will get them and she and I will be able to answer those for you. If you want more information about the rose section at the Idea Garden, you can go illinois.edu slash idea garden. And there's a, there's a button up here for borders and sections and you choose roses and you can choose the plant list and we'll have all the roses we have and there'll be a description with information about that rose. And if you have, if you want more information about the American Rose Society, or you need to contact a, a rose rosarian to check your roses, uh, go to www.rose.org. And uh, Gail and I will be able to send any answers if we left any questions unanswered. I really appreciate you attending. I had to talk really fast to get eight years of my studying into 45 minutes of presentation time. So I hope I covered everything for you. Tabitha, any more Susie, questions? Susie, yeah, you did have quite a few come through. Um, on the barefoot versus container slide, Kim asked, does the soil level need to be above the crown or the graft? You said crown, but pointed to graft. Can you okay. clarify yes. that? They are, if you have a grafted rose, um, 
it is the crown that's where it is where it comes together craft and ground are inner crown are interchangeable that in that way if you have an own root rose it's just the crown it's not the graft so you want that whatever that knot is there where everything where everything from above ground meets the roots down here there's a knot you want that under inches and that's zone 5B. If you're down in seven or nine, you saw those other lines on the slides and you did get a copy of the uh, PowerPoint so you can look at those again. I tried to include a lot of verbiage on some of them so that you had that to go back to. But um, in our area for winter protection, especially in wind, we want that at least two inches below the soil level. Okay. Hey. Um, yeah, you had quite a few more. <clears throat> Excuse me. On the well, fire away. All right. And, and the... if you have to leave, you can. Um, I I don't know. We we can't post the answers to this later, can we? Well, we could email it to the participants if you'd like. Okay. I did. I do have like twenty six that I think we did try to cover. Maybe not extensively. So, like I said, if you think of more, um, please go ahead to ask them. Gardener, but go ahead, Tabitha. Okay, so on tools needed to prune roses slide, uh, Judy asked, "What percent alcohol do you use to sterilize?" Thank you, thank you, thank you. Seventy percent. So that is most commonly um, if you go to the drugstores, Walgreens, um, even I don't know Walmart, anywhere near the pharmacy, they even now have it in a little squarish squirt bottle, so you don't even have to put it in a bigger bottle. But I just bought the big brown bottle and dumped it in that, and then the team started showing up with these little bottles, which are handy. Okay. And refillable. Yeah. Um, okay, Jana asked if we could please list again the varieties of earth kind roses. Yes, and you know what? I th I'm going to send you a list um, I found after I did that. I had pictures of the um, slides, but there are there is a list with all the names, and I think that might be a handy thing that we can send out um, to everybody. Okay. Because you know, uh, this is this is Belinda's dream. This is a red knockout rose, so the knockout, see it isn't, this is a not a brand. This is roses that have gone through trials to see without chemicals, without anything but watering, they test a bunch of different roses to see which makes it. They even subject them to rose rosette disease and the other issues that you have in uh, roses and these came out winners. This little one here is the polyantha, which is a fairy, which is about the size of a miniature rose. This is New Dawn, which is an excellent, excellent surviving climber. Um, some of the others, like uh, one of them is Cecil Bruner. I can't remember all the names, but I do, I did find a list with the names and the information about it. So uh, too late to include in the packet, but I will send that out by email if you're interested in that. Great. Thank you, Susie. Uh-huh. Um, on you. the These are great question. Yeah, they great are good questions. questions. So on the climbing rose pruning slide, Julie yeah. asked, could you please explain how that lateral training would work with a somewhat narrow arbor? Uh, yes, that, that narrow arbor that we have in the middle of the idea garden is less than a foot wide. So when I can only tr support three canes on that, um, that was back on the winter one, let's see. Put them to bed, there we go. Um, which one was up close? See how narrow that, that uh, trellis is right here? So what I'm gonna do come spring, I'm gonna pick three of these canes. These out here are hard to bend all the way back in. So if I have an opportunity, if I don't need one of those, I'd cut it off. So I've got three hopefully kind of close in here. I will take this one 45 degrees out to this side and then next, when it gets, oops, sorry, I keep hitting the wrong thing. 
Um, when I get it over as far as it'll go here, I've got to zigzag it all the way up. Now here comes the trick. You've got three of them to do that. You really don't want them crossing. So when I'm using that soft tie, I'll tie it around the cane to the, the trellis when I can. But when I'm coming back here, I might have to train the middle one or the last one I put to one of the other canes. I do what I call a crazy eight. I take the soft tie, I tie it around the middle cane here, and I leave long tails. I twist it and I have these tails and I put the cane in between those and I twist it again. Does that make sense? And then that way they don't rub. And I know Sally had a question about tying for security. When you tie it, you don't want it to move at all. That's why I like the soft ties because the soft ties keeps it because anytime it can move, it's gonna rub. And that will put, that will kill the rest of the cane from that point on most of the time. You may just get a scar, but most of the time, the rest of the cane just starts dying off, the leaves wither, and then the cane turns brown, and then you've got to cut it back. And so your nice uh, six foot cane is now a four foot cane, and you got to wait for it to grow again. But I just keep doing that all the way up, zigzag, zigzag, until you've got it covered. But the narrower trellises are definitely a challenge. Thank, thank you for you. that good question. Yeah, thank you. Okay, so um, Judy asks, do the Rambler roses have to have a support of some kind? Yes. They, if they don't, they will sprawl across the ground, you know, or anything they can grab hold of. If you look in old cemeteries or uh, old abandoned farm sites where they used to have the Rambler roses, they will grow up a tree. They will grow up the side of a barn. Now, rose climbers, ramblers or climbers, uh, do not have any little sucker things like clematis. They can't cling. They have to have something to hold it there. But once they get up in a tree, they just go crazy. So you'll see old cemeteries with, uh, especially in the south where they grow a longer uh, season than we do up here, they'll grow right up in those trees and like especially the Spanish moss hanging down is really cool. But they usually bloom, that's for the old June roses, they only bloom the one time. There are some old garden roses. I have Zephyrine Druhan. She is shade tolerant and she is thornless and she blooms repeatedly for an old garden rose. That's, and she's fragrant like you can't stand it. She has a raspberry fragrance to her. So that's why I have that one, because I wanted an old garden rose, and I picked that one because it sounded like the best. All right, great. On the rose problem side, uh, the Casey yeah. asks, are you saying that the cane borer is a beneficial insect except to roses? Yes, kind of. She is beneficial to roses because they um, parasitic wash, you know, they lay their eggs in the unbeneficial insect and then that egg bores its way out, killing the bad guy. I wish we could just get them to do it to Japanese beetles. But yes, uh, and that is mostly... Uh, it can take down a rose, but usually it only takes down part of a cane. If you're out there scouting your roses frequently or you don't have many, you'd notice it right away when you see the cane turning brown and the borer in there. We have one rose team member that I think is the best spotter for, she finds all the borers all the time. All right, great. Um... On the rose problems fungus slide, what fungicide, uh, let's see, Kennera asks, what fungicide do you recommend? Okay, um, whatever you choose, and we do have some definite favorites, um, you need to mix them up. You need to trick the rose. Fungus become resistance for fun to fungicides, fungicides. So we're gonna try one called Green Cure Fungicide, which is an organic this year, and we're putting that in the mix. 
we usually use Banner Max and Manco Zeb together. One's a contact killer, one's a preventive. Um, we use both of those. They are very reliable. And then because at the time we weren't using the uh, Green Cure Organic, we added um, one called Heritage. What I like about Heritage, not its price, it's very expensive, is that it goes on clear and doesn't leave a milky film on your leaves. Mancozeb and uh, Bannermax combination leaves like a sticky, creamy film on your roses, and I hate to use it, especially before we're having garden walk. So I always try to use the heritage if I need to um, right before garden walk. New thinking on roses is really look at that disease resistance and pick, there's plenty of pink roses if that's what you're looking for, but then look for one that's disease resistant so that you don't have to use all the chemicals on it. Get the pH at the right uh, level so that it can take up those nutrients. It helps its own immune system, just like we are. If we eat well, we know we feel better. Um, you know, if we, we uh, not get our nutritional needs, we have issues, just like that. So they're now saying, and not so much preventive, which used to be what everybody said, you've got to spray your roses every 10 days. New thinking is um, you would not take an antibiotic to prevent you from getting a cold or a flu. So wait until you have a problem before you start treating it because the new thinking is that could be the reason they've built up so much resistance is that people were spraying them every 10 days. And when that fungicide falls into the soil, it kills the good fungi as well as the bad. So just like all the bad news you hear about, um, you know, overuse of chemicals, it, it is true. So if you can get the soil healthy and only treat when you need to, um, I think I think we'll be better off. Okay. So it's not too late to treat it then, huh? It's it's no, it's not. Mm -mm. Okay. That's why we used. Uh, there used to be a product called lime sulfur that we sprayed the roses with when we put them to bed, and the EPA has taken that off the market. So overuse. So uh, now we use a copper or a sulfur fungicide to spray the canes to prevent any disease that we might have missed from developing, especially if you use the rose cone versus the healing. The healing, you're going to see um, more things if you visit the garden, even in the winter. Okay. Um, on the rabbits and voles slide, um, MJ commented. <laughs> MJ commented that um, they've used dried blood effectively around their shrubs. That blood meal. I did try that. Also, I forgot about that. Um, I had. I live on a 200-acre piece of ground, and um, one of the things we did as a conservation measure was plant one acre of alfalfa and brome grass combined, which was great nesting for pheasants. My husband was a fan of pheasants. And so I invited all these, I had this beautiful habitat for all these rodents <laughs> and cute little bunnies they are until they eat $400 worth of plants I put out one day after I did some construction on the house that gave me a whole new bed, $400 of plants were gone in the morning. But I did try all the things they recommended at the garden center before. And I still have, I got tons of, I got bunnies, I got squirrels, I got a pair of ducks, I got a drake and a hen that's sitting on a nest and she comes and eats. I put bird food out for her every day. I feed the squirrels so they leave my garden alone. <laughs> so so I don't mind a, a little balance, but 33 against one was too many. So you That's have tried blood around your I shrubs. did. Um, yes, yeah. I did, and I forgot about that. I think that might have been the first thing I tried. Yeah, I've tried it too, and I it didn't work for me. It did not. It well, I... <clears throat> They, uh, I just thought it was because I had too many. 
you know, that they, they could get past that. They were hungry. Could be. And Jay says they've used it effectively, so must just um, depend on the location, I suppose. Well, okay, you had a couple. If you if your neighbor has something he's not using something like that on, then they just say, Oh, let's eat there for a while. <laughs> let's let's go next door. So if somebody has something equally as appealing and they're not using a repellent on it, I'm sure they'll go for that, the easy first. Mm -hmm. Okay. Thank you. Um, Kenra asks for fertilizer, you talked about liquid fertilizer, but the, um, the all fertilizer. I did, and I and then I bad mouth the all in one because it has insecticide in it. Um, there's a Mills Easy Mix. There's a lot of liquid ones. Uh, the people at Decatur Rose Society, uh, you recommend uh, Monty's. I have not tried that yet. Um, the American Rose Society recommends Mills Easy Feed. That's a liquid and you just dilute it and pour it on at the base of the plant. Uh, that you'd have to read the label and see if you, it really, you should get a soil test. And I forgot to say that. Uh, soil test and watch for that pH, but you can get a soil test that will give you recommendations. And those recommendations usually give you a low number, a high number, and then where your number is, just like when you go to the doctor and you get your labs done. So then you'll know what your garden is low on or over in, and you'll want to watch not adding more or you need to add more to it. But there, there are, if you, um, I'm sure there's something, I'm sure even, um, oh, can't think of the name of it. Um, the Alaska, the Alaska is a fish fertilizer and you can do that on a brand new planting. Uh, the fish um, emulsion and, um, and the Super Thrive, that is the micronutrients, and it even has a liquid microrhizae in it. But there was one more. Uh, uh, Dr. Earth, I think, has a liquid one. So it just depends on where you are. I mean, if you go online, you can probably find just about all of them. Uh, if you look at Rose suppliers, they always sell products to um, take care of the roses. But the fish fertilizer is probably one of the most popular liquid ones. Um, one of our rose people lives on a river. She said she thought it drew raccoons to her yard and to her rose garden. And then I had another uh, rose volunteer who lives in the same town. And she said she did not have a problem at all. So I, I don't know. Um, it does smell, it does have a fishy smell, but it is a good one and any, anything with kelp in it is a good liquid fertilizer for roses. Great, thank you. Um, a couple more questions have come through here. So Miranda asks, how do you prune a fairy rose? Some stems seem to be thicker than others. Right. Uh, those you don't need to do very much pruning at all, except for your shaping or if you have dead or diseased canes in there. So you start with the dead, anything dead, sometimes you've got to lift those up a little to see underneath, um, but they don't really take much pruning at all because most of their canes are the small pencil thin, so you wouldn't be cutting all of them out. But just just use your own good judgment if it if it looks like it's not going to have any leaf growth on it or um you know you can tell that it's diseased just go ahead and cut that out and then it's up to you if you don't like the shape of it uh you can shape it to your how it fits in where your location is okay great um casey asks have you heard of using coffee grounds around roses Yes, there's uh, the soil. coffee grounds, tea bags, and banana peels are Rose's friends. They really are. <laughs> but if you compost all that, and then you have the mix together, that's even better. Uh, yes, it is fine for your roses. It's very beneficial. 
I don't know if they like the caffeine or it's just uh, another uh, mulchy, loose kind of thing. Um, I'm doing an experiment with mint compost and it is very expensive to buy from the growers. And so I am planting a lot of mint in my herb garden and some along with those roses in my companion planting bed. And um, because they repel things and, and garlic. So I have some curly chives and some garlic and I'm putting three types of mint out in that bed to repel insects. And then if I need to cut it because it's getting aggressive, I am going to compost it. And hopefully then that can be used also as a, a deterrent to the insects. Great. Um, it looks like that was the last question that's come through the chat box, Susie. Uh, right. Judy did post the, it looks like the Earthkind Roses website. Okay, link I, I the chat box. Yeah, there is, it, and okay, excellent. So if that's the one that has the description of each of the roses with the names, you'll be happy with that. Uh, it's, there's some really good roses out there. And like I said, we have four of them. And some of the roses cross over into those antiques and the old garden roses are, you know, so uh, a lot of the old garden roses are naturally disease resistant. Yes, so they that's are. A, yeah. So that, you know, they just uh, have that old genes in them before all this hybridizing um, took some of the strength out of them. And old garden roses, for the most part, tend to be more fragrant. Yes, they definitely are. Definitely. And that's something I think too many hybridizers have bred out of roses. And I'm, and glad, to see, I'm glad to see that they're starting to bring the fragrance back and, and make it important. They are. Um, I think there's a new knockout rose that's doing really well. And I believe they bred that to be more fragrant than, you know, first they were doing all the disease resistance, easy care and everything. And now they're saying, okay, we got that down pretty good. Let's work some fragrance back into it. And I don't, that, that is still beyond my realm is how they hybridize the rose with different characteristics. That's, that's science beyond what I want to be involved in. And I don't know if I'll get there, but I am taking the consultant rosarian. I was supposed to take in March to take the test, a, an all day test. And then the COVID-19 put a squash on that. And so they have just figured out how to do them at zoom meetings. And I take my first one on the 30th and it's going to be on fertilizer. That's exciting. Good luck. It is. I am excited um, to get it started. <laughs> um, Tom mentions, mentions, Tom Ward mentions that he started mint compost for you already. Um, you're getting <gasps> Yay, lots of Tom. thanks. You're getting yes. lots of thanks and wonderful presentations, Gail and Susie. And Casey asks one more question, um, if I may. How do you respond to those who ask, are roses worth the fuss? Oh, of course. Uh, you just have to, it's America's favorite flower. It still is. Um, and the reason people don't do it is just that reputation it has. Um, you guys have to stay tuned if you're local here in Champaign-Urbana. Uh, we had a lot of uh, um, issues in the Rose Garden this year because we weren't able to get in. We're restricted from volunteering in the Idea Garden this year. And so any we will we will be replacing next year, we will choose a more sustainable rose. And so hopefully we can show people that really it isn't all that fuss. Um, if you're showing roses, if you're exhibiting roses, I should say, that, I don't know how they do it. They put net bags over them so bugs don't get to them. You know, they cut all the blooms off, saving one bloom to show on a rose bush. That's not what I want. I want to sit with my morning cup of coffee on the deck and look out and get the fragrance and see all the roses blooming. But if you want to exhibit roses, you will still be doing all that maintenance that I, that they are beginning to realize is not all that necessary. Well, and the one thing that I found is 
with roses, timing is everything. And if you get into the habit of doing the right things at the right time, they aren't as much work as people make them out to be. As proven by us not getting in the Rose Garden this year. You know, they're, they're really looking like they're missing us. And that's a good point, Gail. That's true with anything in gardening. Any, anything in gardening before it gets out of hand. Right. Know? Right. Yeah. Supposed to have fun in our gardens, right? Yes. Um, <laughs> not be stressed out. But stay ahead of the game. Yes, it is worth it if you get out there. And my favorite part of rose growing, rose growing, is the rose care. I want to take that rose and make it the best little thing it can be out there. And so, if you spend about an hour on it in the spring, waking it up and pruning it and everything, it's the rewards are worth it, definitely. Excellent. Well, thank you both, Gail and Susie. Um, again, you have quite a few uh, thank you messages in the chat box. Very informative well, presentation. You. Love your enthusiasm for roses. So thanks to both of you. And do you have anything you want to say before we end the program tonight? Well, if they have any other questions, be sure to contact the horticulture hotline and one of us will get back to them. Great, thank you, Gail. And it sounds like uh, we will be sending an email with the evaluation and some of the additional things I think that Susie was going to send. Is that right? A list sounds of the earth excellent. kind roses it, and something else. Well, thank you for your kind comments. Um, I, sometimes you get me started, I have to really stick to the script because I can go on and on. <laughs> so thank you for staying later. I'm sorry I went over but I wanted to answer as many questions as we could. And I hope the packets we sent ahead of time are helpful to you. All right, everyone have a great evening. You too. Thank you, Tabitha. Thanks again. You too. Bye. 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 <laughs>